Good morning. This is another edition of the Passball Show brought to you by JohnPielli.com, by Two Ways, One Patch of Food Truck, located in Scranton, Pennsylvania, by St. Aloysius Church and School in Jackson, New Jersey. Happy to be with you on this, what I guess you'd call a football Monday, really the last hardcore football Monday that we're going to have, really until next year. Or maybe until, I guess, a recap of the Super Bowl, which we'll see in two weeks. And what you're really going to hear over the course of the next couple of weeks is a lot of the same stuff that's just going to be repeated over and over and over again. And I plan to dedicate today's show by talking about uh, some of the laziest takes you're going to hear for the upcoming Super Bowl, Super Bowl 54, which of course features the San Francisco 49ers and the Kansas City Chiefs. I'll start out today by talking about things that I find interesting, and that is the fact that the Chiefs are back to the Super Bowl for the third time. They also have an AFC championship as the Dallas Texans in 1962. The San Francisco 49ers are back to the Super Bowl for the seventh time. Only appeared in one other championship game prior to the Super Bowl era when they lost in 1949 to the Cleveland Browns. Now, there are going to be a lot of lazy takes, like I said, when it comes to the, the upcoming Super Bowl. And I would suggest, and I actually think this would be a good idea, not that I advocate drinking, not that I think it's a good idea that you should go out and drink excessively, but if you set yourself up with a drinking game of every time, whether you're watching the Super Bowl preview, whether you're watching your favorite show before the Super Bowl, whether it's the broadcast, the live broadcast, and every time one of these same lazy topics are brought up, I think you should go out there and have yourself a drink. And what the NFL has done, unfortunately, it's dragged out the process and the amount of time between the championship games and the Super Bowl that there's just nothing else to talk about. And you can break down the history of the two franchises that are involved there. It's fine. You can find one interesting connection to the 49ers and the Chiefs. The last time the Chiefs won the Super Bowl, or the only time the Chiefs won the Super Bowl, Super Bowl IV, the 1969 season, which of course was January of 1970, one of their assistant coaches was a man by the name of Bill Walsh. He was on Hank Stram's staff. And of course, Bill Walsh, the three-time Super Bowl champion head coach of the San Francisco 49ers, it's nice to see that connection there. I'm interested in Richard Sherman getting back to the Super Bowl. And really after him tearing his Achilles and his career seemed like it wasn't going to be the same, he came back and became a very significant player. Really is one of the elite top shutdown corners in the National Football League and is probably paving his path or punching his ticket to the Pro Football Hall of Fame once he's finished playing. There, there are some good stories. They are. And, you know, you can talk about some of them. And, listen, Andy Reid up to a certain point, it, it's great that he's back to the Super Bowl, but I will promise you that that's going to be amongst my list of lazy Super Bowl takes. Because you don't have to be the most informative. You don't have to have done the most research. It's very easy to throw that up on any talk, radio, or television show. So, there's six of them. And the show may be short today. We're going to do another show on Wednesday. We're going to focus on the Baseball Hall of Fame. And actually, it's nice today, right, to not talk about cheating in Major League Baseball and the Astros scandal and... Uh, whether they had buzzers on, whether uh, they were banging the trash cans and knew what pitch was coming and how long they were doing it and how many teams are involved in it. Is this more widespread than we thought? It's just nice to take a break from that. Talk some football today. Wednesday, we'll be back on. We're going to talk about the Baseball Hall of Fame. We know 
It's a sore topic here in the PBS, and it's going to be very hard to talk about the Baseball Hall of Fame without me going on my rant when it comes to the feelings of how much of a joke the Baseball Hall of Fame is. The players that it chooses to include, the players it chooses to not include. But today, it's getting ready for the Super Bowl. And I know it's not going to be for another two weeks. And, you know, by this time next week, you're going to have that quote-unquote media day. And whether it's the NFL Network, whether it's any major sports network, whether it's anybody that's out there on what they used to call Radio Row, which, by the way, it's not what that used to be. It used to be a handful of different outlets that were out there. It used to be a big deal that you were there. Now, if you try hard enough, you could get press credentials. You, know, you could be amongst hundreds and maybe even thousands that are out there in that same spot, basically fighting over the same people that are walking down that little area. If you're Jerry Rice or if you're O.J. Simpson. You're O.J. Simpson, you want to go out there on what you used to call Radio Row, you could get yourself about five to ten interviews because everybody's going to be like, hey, that's O.J. Simpson, let's get him on the show. So Radio Row isn't what it used to be. It wasn't, it wasn't what it was in the mid-1990s, even the early part of the 2000s. But you know, when we talk about Super Bowl previews, which we know the Super Bowl is going to start to be previewed today. There's going to be lines out probably favoriting the Chiefs by a little bit, but I, I, I think we're pretty close to a pick em right now. And actually, let me see. There, there's got to be some Super Bowl odds out there. Because, you know what? Yes, Kansas City favored it by one. And that's not bad. That I, I, was, I was pretty much right able to, to, to point that out. So, Chiefs are getting a point in a Super Bowl as of now. And obviously, a lot of time will happen between now and in two weeks. And, you know, maybe the betters will shift the odds. But also... There's going to be storylines. There's going to be some asshole. There's going to be some clown that's going to be a jerk. That's going to make a name for himself. That's going to use being in the Super Bowl as that opportunity to make sure people know who he is. And for that, I don't blame the media for. I don't blame the media for gravitating towards that jerk that either wants to make comments about the other team or wants to have some over-dramatized story that draws a lot of attention to themselves. I don't blame the media for that. But here's six points that I think if you wanted to play a drinking game, you could get yourself very intoxicated within a short period of time. Number six is going to be that Jimmy Garoppolo played for the New England Patriots. And obviously, we all know that. He was Tom Brady's backup for a handful of seasons, and Bill Belichick wanted Garoppolo to take over as the quarterback for the New England Patriots and be their long-term quarterback. And you look at different things that ended up happening with whether it's Tom Brady and the owner kind of getting together to decide that Brady was going to stick there and Garoppolo was going to be traded and Belichick traded Garoppolo to the San Francisco 49ers all the way to the other side of the country. And he... NFC West, pretty much the farthest that he could have traded him. Jimmy Garoppolo in the last three years as the starting quarterback for the San Francisco 49ers, including the two playoff games, has a record of 21-4. and four. The San Francisco 49ers in the last three years, with anybody else other than Jimmy Garoppolo as the starting quarterback of his team, are 4-20. and 20. The last 50 games, which is the last 48 regular season games and two postseason games, the San Francisco 49ers are 25 and 25. So I brought a little life to what's going to be a very lazy take. But you're going to hear a lot about Jimmy Garoppolo playing for the New England Patriots. Number five, Travis Kelsey, the tight end for the Kansas City Chiefs, has a brother that played for the Super Bowl 52 champion Philadelphia Eagles. And you're going to hear about Jason Kelsey and Travis Kelsey. And one of the themes, the lazy Super Bowl themes, is going to be members of the family. And you're going to hear an awful lot of this. 
as we get close to the Super Bowl. So when you know that somebody doesn't have anything else to talk about, anything else constructive to bring to the table, first they're going to start talking about Jimmy Garoppolo and the Patriots. Then they're going to start talking about Travis Kelsey and his brother Jason. And Jason's an offensive lineman for the Super Bowl 52 champion, Philadelphia Eagles. Number four, Kansas City Chiefs. It's been 50 years since they've played in the Super Bowl. Exactly 50 years since they played in Super Bowl four against the Minnesota Vikings, which I will throw some decent facts in there. They won the game 23-7. Hank Stram was the coach. Len Dawson was the quarterback. Like I said, Bill Walsh was on the sideline with Hank Stram as an assistant. 50 years. And it's great for the city of Kansas City. So I could respect that. A team, a city that had a baseball World Series five years ago for the first time in 30 years. It's nice to see some prominence to kind of a middle American city. And I say middle American because we don't talk about Kansas City as being this high media market. And it's not. It's a, it's a mid-market. It's a good market. They have a great fan base. And hopefully their fans can enjoy a Super Bowl. But once again, you're going to hear a lot of it over the next two weeks. The Chiefs haven't been to the Super Bowl in 50 years. Lazy take number three is going to be about Kyle Shanahan. And Kyle Shanahan is the son of Super Bowl champion head coach Mike Shanahan. And Mike Shanahan won two Super Bowls as a head football coach of the Denver Broncos. And his son, Kyle, is the head football coach of the San Francisco 49ers. And you're going to hear about that father and son and Mike. The, you know, pictures or videos of him in a press box. And you're going to hear two weeks of Kyle Shanahan being the son of Mike Shanahan. And let's be serious. Anybody that is involved in the Super Bowl was the son of somebody. But Kyle Shanahan was the son of a Super Bowl winning head coach. And you're going to hear, oh, if Kyle wins, he'll be the first father and son in Super Bowl history to both win the Super Bowl, lazy take number three. Lazy take number two, and it is one of the most lazy takes that you can have when it comes to this coming Super Bowl. There is some reason for it, and I think the Andy Reid story is going to be an outstanding one, especially if he's over there holding the Lombardi Trophy at the end of Super Bowl 54. It will be well-deserved. Some interesting facts. The 15 years that it's been since Andy Reid's last Super Bowl, when he was with the Philadelphia Eagles, when they lost to the New England Patriots the first time. <laughs> Excuse me. That's the second longest gap in pro football history for NFL head coaches. The first was Dick Vermeil. Dick Vermeil appeared in a Super Bowl as a head football coach at the Philadelphia Eagles when he lost to the Oakland Raiders. And 19 years later was the head football coach of the Los Angeles, I think the St. Louis, I'm sorry, the St. Louis Rams when they beat the Tennessee Titans in the 1999 Super Bowl. So that was an interesting fact, but the lazy fact is going to be Andy Reid can he get that Super Bowl? Andy Reid, the amount of games that he's coached in the National Football League. Andy Reid, the amount of playoff games he has coached in the National Football League. Will he finally get his Super Bowl? That's lazy take number two. And lazy take number one, and I'm sure you guessed it by now, if you're thinking of the laziest of all lazy takes when it comes to Super Bowl 54 that you're going to be hearing over the course of the next two weeks, that's Chiefs quarterback Patrick Mahomes Father Pat pitched in the major leagues for the Minnesota Twins and the New York Mets. And Patrick Mahomes is a kid wearing a baseball jersey on a baseball field. Patrick Mahomes at a press conference wearing his dad's number 23 New York Mets jersey. It's nice. Pat Mahomes was a guest on the PBS 
great dude. I'm sure his son is, you know, not, not that far off from the tree. Seems like a nice guy. And listen, all these players, coaches, deserve the attention they're getting. And especially in Kansas City, if you think about it last year and how close they came to getting to the Super Bowl when they lost that overtime game in the AFC Championship to the New England Patriots. It, it's great that they're there. It's great that the 49ers are there. But I have a call out to those that are providing coverage when it comes to the Super Bowl over the next couple weeks. To just not be lazy with your takes. Stop talking about Jimmy Garoppolo playing for the Patriots. Stop talking about Travis Kelsey's brother, Jason. Stop talking about the Chiefs being in the Super Bowl for the first time in 50 years. Stop talking about Kyle Shanahan being Mike Shanahan's son. Stop talking about Andy Reid and the question over whether he will finally win the Super Bowl. And please... Please stop talking about Patrick Mahomes and his father. His father played in the major leagues. He was a pitcher in Major League Baseball. I get it. Lazy takes as you get ready for Super Bowl number 54. This copyright and broadcast is authorized under internet rights granted by the World Wide Web and is solely for the entertainment of our audience. Any publication, reproduction, or other use of the pictures, descriptions, and accounts of this show without the express written consent of the past ball show. JohnPLA.com and JohnPLA LLC is prohibited. Any commercial or other use of the program, such as by charge and admission for its showing, is similarly prohibited. So, a couple other interesting football tidbits that I'm going to go over today. Um, Derrick Henry of the Tennessee Titans really kind of had a coming of age party. You know, you're talking about a guy that pretty much single-handedly led the Titans from being on the fringes of getting to the playoffs in the American Football Conference. If you look back at the last couple games, the Tennessee Titans sitting there with an 8-5 and five record, but three tough games to finish off their season. And they had control of their own destiny, but they had a couple really tough games. They had the Houston Texans to play twice. The New Orleans Saints sandwiched in the middle. A very good case could be made that could have, could have lost all three of those games. And they lost a tough one against the Houston Texans in Tennessee. A game that the final score was a little closer than the game actually was. They came back late. They fell short. The New Orleans Saints, they got off to a good start, 14 nothing, And then Drew Brees and Sean Payton just ran rough shot on them. Went to town. Outscored them 38-14 to in a game that, once again, looked a little closer than it really was with the Saints winning 38-28. to So with the Pittsburgh Steelers losing a game to the New York Jets, it was the Titans who retained control of their own destiny as they got into week number 17 in their final matchup of the season against a Houston Texans team that chose to rest its regulars. They didn't start Deshaun Watson because if you have a player like Deshaun Watson who has at least some injuries over the course of his career, a major one a couple years in the past, you don't want to risk your star quarterback getting hurt as you're getting ready for a playoff game in a game that doesn't mean anything. The Texans were set in the seed that they were going to have. They were going to be the number four seed regardless, whether they won, whether they lost. Some players they played, some players they didn't, including the quarterback. Titans got a very good performance from Derrick Henry and got themselves into the playoffs as the number six seed. What ended up playing the New England Patriots, who, by the way, if it wasn't for a miraculous win by the Miami Dolphins in Week 17 in Foxborough against the Patriots, it would have been the Patriots who would have had the number two seed. Now we can talk about this as being one of the lazy takes. I, I think it would be far down the road if we were ranking the laziest of lazy takes. It certainly isn't in my top six. But the Patriots, had they beat the Dolphins, which you figure if the Patriots and Dolphins played 100 games in Foxborough, However, separated to where each team had enough time to recover 
or prepare and play those games one after another, maybe every week for 100 straight weeks. Patriots would probably win, what, 97, 98 of those games? So the Miami Dolphins pulling off one of the upsets really set the dynamics in effect that the Patriots were not going to be the number two seed and not going to have a first round by in the AFC playoffs for the first time, and it seemed like forever. And whether the fact that it was Kansas City that had the first round by, that meant that it was New England that had the home playoff game against the Tennessee Titans. And obviously, the Chiefs ended up beating the Titans, and they beat them pretty sound, no question about it. Nobody comes out of this game thinking that the Titans should have won the AFC championship. Excellent performance by the Kansas City Chiefs. But let's say it was Kansas City, Tennessee in the wild card round. The three seed Chiefs at home against the six seed Titans. Derrick Henry, does he have the performance that he had against the New England Patriots? Is it as close of a game as Titans Patriots was? Obviously, it would have told a, a long story, an interesting story. You would add Patriots Chiefs in a division round. And one of those teams would have faced either the Ravens or the Texans in the AFC Championship game. A total different landscape. Now, listen, the Patriots, like I said, had a lot to do with this. Not just losing to Miami, but losing the next week at home to the Tennessee Titans in the wild card round. Unexpected. But it was a very good performance by the Titans at a game that they earned. They played very good defense. They ran the football well. And they made some big plays and big spots. So you look at, you know, from a football interest standpoint, just the simple New England Patriots having a first round bye could have changed the whole complexion of this playoffs. And what would have happened if it was Chiefs Patriots? Would the Chiefs have finally gotten over the hump? Did the Chiefs benefit from facing the Titans as opposed to the Patriots at some point of the football playoffs? But the point I wanted to get to, Derrick Henry accelerated himself when it comes to one of the, or if not the elite running back in the National Football League. And I'm sure from a fantasy football perspective, he's going to be getting a lot of love next season. A lot of fantasy football players are going to be looking to have Derrick Henry as their RB1. And I think that's going to be a good idea. And you look back in kind of in retrospect to this season for the Tennessee Titans, one that had some ups and downs. They were two and four. They made the quarterback change to Ryan, Ryan Tannehill. They finished the season strong, even though they lost two of their last three games. Had a nice run in the playoffs. Two very big playoff wins against two very big AFC teams. And the question is going to be, Mike Vrabel, who preaches discipline, and you see the Titans have proven themselves to be a very disciplined team. Is this a team that can be considered a prohibitive favorite to win the AFC South next year? Obviously, the most competitive division in football. Maybe it's not obvious. Maybe you don't understand that. Maybe you think of some of the divisions in the NFC Let's say the NFC West has got San Francisco and Seattle and Los Angeles. The NFC South has got, of course, the Saints and the Panthers and the Falcons. Who, when, when they're all playing well, it's pretty competitive. And, of course, the NFC North with the Packers and the Bears and the Lions and the Vikings. I don't know how I'm forgetting the Vikings. Those divisions are all competitive. But, man, there's no division that beats the hell out of each other any more than the AFC South. The Titans, the Jaguars, the Texans, and of course the Indianapolis Colts. Colts ran supreme in that division for a long time with the likes of Peyton Manning and even in the days of Andrew Luck when he was healthy. But you've seen the Jaguars two years ago going to the AFC Championship game against the Patriots in a game that was very close. Houston Texans, their share of AFC South championships 
And we know about the Colts with Peyton, Peyton and a healthy Andrew Luck. Could it be the time for the Titans to reign supreme in that division? It's something that, uh, listen, I think you're going to have some interest in who their quarterback is. Do they decide to franchise Ryan Tannehill? Do they move on from Marcus Mariota? I think they probably will. I think it makes sense. Instead of you know working on a new contract or bringing him back for another year, yeah, you let him be a free agent, sign his own deal, maybe work with somebody, take another job at a National Football League. His career certainly isn't over. And I think about the Green Bay Packers on the other side, the team that lost the NFC Championship game to the San Francisco 49ers. Now, what stood out about this game was the game pretty much started and it was all San Francisco. San Francisco ran the football all over them. Aaron Rodgers had a hard time really getting anything going offensively until the game didn't really mean anything. And Aaron Rodgers, who has had a history of being interested in blaming others, does he blame his first-year head coach, Matt LaFleur? Does he blame anybody as much as he blamed Mike McCarthy? for the Green Bay Packers' struggles. Yeah, and I think it is ironic that Aaron Rodgers is in that State Farm commercial where the message is to basically treat his quote-unquote agent like the biggest piece of garbage in the world. And he can say, hey, it's just a commercial. It's just out for ratings. Aaron Rodgers is getting paid. The guy that's playing his agent's getting paid. Patrick Mahomes is getting paid. State Farm's dishing out a lot of money for those commercials. But when you have a guy with Aaron Rodgers, when you question his character a little bit, and I do, I question his character and his choice of blame when it comes to what's going on with the Green Bay Packers to say that this team should have been so much better or could have been so much better if it wasn't for the head coach. Listen, you didn't have to see eye to eye with the head coach. But his public statements, I thought, were a little over the top. So you ask Aaron Rodgers, maybe in a heat of battle, or maybe you let him sit for a couple days to reflect on this season with the Green Bay Packers. Does he have an issue with play calling? I think one of the biggest issues is the fact that Aaron Rodgers may have lost a step or two. And when we're ranking the quarterbacks or the top quarterbacks in the National Football League, I don't know if we're talking about Aaron Rodgers being a top five anymore. Sure, his numbers look great, you know, in a championship game against the 49ers, but a lot of it was major yardage when the team was behind. And they moved the ball downfield all right when they were trailing by, what, 20 points. Game ended up being a little bit closer than it was, or the action that you saw on the field made it out to be. But I think of Aaron Rodgers, and I wonder... We're talking about a transition when it comes to quarterbacks in the National Football League with guys like Carson Wentz and Jared Goff, who we're evaluating now. I think coming into next year, we're going to see if Carson Wentz is that next generation quarterback. Is Jared Goff, in spite of just being in a Super Bowl last year, obviously he had a disappointing season last year. Is he that type of quarterback? Is Mitch Trubisky with the Chicago Bears that type of quarterback? And, of course, you got the group of quarterbacks that were drafted two years ago. Baker Mayfield, Sam Darnold, Josh Allen, Lamar Jackson. May I even mention the likes of Josh Rosen or Mason Rudolph. And, obviously, the quarterbacks that were drafted last year. So, there's going to be a time where there's going to be a change of the guard when it comes to the top quarterbacks in the National Football League. People are writing off Drew Brees. Not a good performance in the NFC wildcard round. He had a great season. He continues to put up numbers. But is his time getting towards the end? Tom Brady, his worst season as a pro in a national football league. Is his time coming to the end? You know, Obviously, you'll have the contract situation. He's going to be a free agent for the first time. He wants to listen to some offers. Is he serious about leaving the Patriots? Does he want to play for another football franchise? Patrick Mahomes is going to get a ton of attention. And hopefully most of it isn't about who his dad is. 
Hopefully most of it isn't about the human interest story of him wearing the number 23 New York Mets jersey when his father pitched for the New York Mets. Hopefully it's about where Patrick Mahomes ranks amongst the top quarterbacks in the National Football League, and it's pretty hard to keep him away from being number one. There's Russell Wilson. I think Dak Prescott deserves a little bit of love. Drew Brees is still in the mix. Deshaun Watson. There's some really good quarterbacks out there, and obviously the names that we were used to talking about, the Mannings, the Roethlisbergers, the Bradys, the Rivers, they're all kind of getting towards the twilight of their National Football League careers. I think the Richard Sherman story is going to be interesting. Getting back to the Super Bowl. That torn Achilles. Listen, there's been many players that are just as athletic as Richard Sherman and were not able to get back to full strength. And I think what he has been able to do, not only by returning to the field, but playing at such an elite level, it should get as much publicity as it gets. That's a story that I don't think, and, and listen, you could overplay it. You could have every network talking about the same thing. You could have 20 different Richard Sherman stories in one day, and then it'll get a little stale and a little bit old. But I don't think the story about Richard Sherman getting back to the Super Bowl after his torn Achilles being one of the leaders on the Legion of Boom defense with the Seattle Seahawks. I don't think that's a lazy story. A little bit of a recap of the show today. We talked about the laziest Super Bowl points that are going to be brought up over the next two weeks, obviously. Chiefs, 49ers, Super Bowl number 54. Number six is Jimmy Garoppolo, used to play for the Patriots. Number five is Travis Kelsey, the tight end for the Kansas City Chiefs has a brother that's an offensive lineman for the Philadelphia Eagles. Number four is the fact that the Chiefs are back to the Super Bowl for the first time in 50 years. Number three is Kyle Shanahan's father, Mike. Number two, Andy Reid has never won a Super Bowl. And then finally, and I, I will promise any show that I'm listening to or talks or, or watching that decides to bring up the fact that Patrick Mahomes has a father that was a pitcher in Major League Baseball, I'm going to turn that program off. We talked about the 49ers, five-time Super Bowl champions, 1981, 1984, 1989, 1990, and 1995. They lost, was it Super Bowl 50 or 49? Hold on, we'll figure it out. Yeah, he lost the Super Bowl 2012 against the Baltimore Ravens with Jim Harbaugh as the, co as the coach. Also lost the AAFC championship game to the Cleveland Browns in 1949. Kansas City Chiefs won Super Bowl IV, 1969 over the Minnesota Vikings, 23-7. Their head coach was the great Hank Stram, who also led them to an AFC championship as the coach of the Dallas Texans in 1962. According to JohnPielli.com, Hank Stram is number 10 when it comes to the top head football coaches in the history of the National Football League. Bill Walsh was on his staff. Bill Walsh is up in the top five. I think he's number five. One of the best football coaches in the history of the National Football League. Of course, the Chiefs lost Super Bowl I against Vince Lombardi, Bart Starr, and the Green Bay Packers. And they haven't been back to the Super Bowl since. Really excited about this uh, Hall of Fame announcement in baseball. And I am bringing this up kind of in a way to preview my show for this coming Wednesday. We're going to talk about the history of the Hall of Fame. We're going to talk about the biggest snubs in the history of the Hall of Fame. 
And the fact that I actually have a list of 20 deserved Hall of Fame members that are not in baseball's Hall of Fame. You can talk about other sports and say, hey, there's a case that could be made for a player or a coach or two or a couple here and there that could be could be omitted, could be missed, could be forgotten about. And more than likely, pro football, especially basketball, basketball's got the Hall of Fame that's the most watered down amongst all sports. They eventually get it right. They eventually get that person into the Hall of Fame, maybe a couple of years after when it was expected. But once somebody's in the Hall of Fame, nobody cares how long it took you to get there. You are for now and forever known as a Hall of Famer. So I think about baseball and listen, my takes are pretty common as we hit what we'll call the concluding point here in the Passball Show. Always glad to be with you. Brought to you by Two Ways, One Passion Food Truck. Located in Scranton, Pennsylvania, which by the way, is closed for the winter. We'll get, uh, Karen and Jenny will get some more information out there as they get close to the spring and when they're gonna be setting up the whole thing. Also by St. Aloysius Church and School in Jackson, New Jersey. Derek Jeter, probably Larry Walker, maybe Kurt Schilling. And if Kurt Schilling gets in, that's one of my 20 that deserves to, it to be in the Hall of Fame. That no longer has to wait. And it looks like Schilling will fall a little short. And I think Kurt said it himself. He, he's, he's enough of a baseball historian to study the way that the voting process goes. Most of the public ballots are going to be in his favor. And a lot of the private ballots are not going to be in his favor. He threw out the name of Luis Tion great pitcher just hasn't gotten an, enough attention when it comes to the hall of fame he says he has no problem being in the same category as Luis Tia. i disagree i think kurt schilling is an absolute hall of famer not that the comparison to john smoltz means anything but john smoltz is one of the darlings of the media on national broadcast is considered one of the elite people and well-spoken people and people a person that you know wants or is wanted to be heard from the exact opposite is one would think of Kurt Schilling and it's an example of how a media darling and it's really not much offense against John Smoltz but that led to his Hall of Fame candidacy, candidacy over Kurt Schilling you can talk about John Smoltz and Kurt Schilling, and I say at the very least, they had careers that paralleled each other. And you can make a case that Kurt Schilling was a much better postseason pitcher than John Smoltz. Kurt Schilling was a part of three World Series championships and was very integral in each one of those World Series championships. Yes, John Smoltz pitched a ton of World Series games. They won one World Series in 1995. But when you think of elite pitchers on that Atlanta Braves staff, you think of Greg Maddox and Tom Glavin before you think of John Smoltz. And it's not that John Smoltz doesn't belong in the Hall of Fame, but the fact that he was selected on his first year of eligibility and Kurt Schilling is still waiting after a handful of years later is a little bit of a joke now I can talk about Kurt Schilling in, in a positive way here that hey he may get over 70% he may get you know high 60s he's going to be close enough that hey it'll be a matter of time before Kurt Schilling is welcomed into baseball's Hall of Fame I have a problem with the politics that exist with the baseball Hall of Fame and why there's such a difference with Baseball Hall of Fame as opposed to the Pro Football Hall of Fame, to the Basketball Hall of Fame, and to a lesser level, the National Hockey League Hall of Fame. So we will talk about that on Wednesday. Once again, you think of the Super Bowl, and it is such a national event because so many people are drawn to the Super Bowl that wouldn't be for many other events. You know, regular non-baseball fans aren't really paying attention to the World Series. 
some are, but not in the level of the event and the holiday that the Super Bowl has become. So for those that may not know so much about football, some of the storylines may not be as lazy, but for those who enjoy talking about football, I just suggest to stay away from the six lazy Super Bowl 54 topics that we are going to hear over and over and over and over again. Jimmy Garoppolo used to play for the Patriots. Travis Kelsey has a brother, Jason, that played for the Philadelphia Eagles when they won the Super Bowl two years ago. The Chiefs haven't been in the Super Bowl in 50 years. Kyle Shanahan has a father, Mike, that won two Super Bowls as a head coach. Andy Reid, is he finally going to get that eluded Super Bowl victory? And Patrick Mahomes has a father that pitched in Major League Baseball. Please stay away from those lazy topics. Hope you guys enjoy your Monday. Be back with you Wednesday, like I said, as we will do a little bit of a recap of the Baseball Hall of Fame selection and induction. This is the Passball Show brought to you by JohnPLA.com, by Two Ways, One Passion Food Truck, and by St. Aloysius Church and School in Jackson, New Jersey. God bless you, and as always, I'll see you on the other side.